Hi, everybody. Welcome back to On The Deal. We have a special guest today. I say special because one of my favorite people from CTV is joining us today, Cynthia Lois. Thank you so much for coming on the DL. How are you doing? Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm doing well. How about you? I'm okay. I'm sure most people know who you are if they are watching and listening to this, but if you don't, Cynthia is the co-host of The Social and also creator of Find Your Pleasure, which we will be talking lots about. And also we were going to focus in on something I guess it's highly personal. We just said this before, if there's anything personal, you don't want to say, but <laughs> this is quite a personal <laughs> conversation. Um, but that's what we do on the DL. We talk about things out loud that a lot of people don't necessarily want to say out loud, but we are talking about masturbation and self-love. And I feel where I'm at in my stage and age is that of course I can talk about this. And a lot of people still don't talk about masturbation as if it's so taboo. It's like the worst thing when in fact, it's one of the healthiest, most loveliest, wonderful thing you can do for yourself. Absolutely. I mean, it's funny. I think we were all, most of us were raised with some amount of shame around this. And I've been reflecting a lot about this lately as I'm also the parent now of an eight-year-old son. And the messages that I received growing up, I really have, no, I'm not trying to blame my parents entirely, but they didn't do a great job, let's just say, um, talking about bodies or talking about sexuality. And so we were sort of like many people out there left to kind of figure things out on our own. And while no one ever explicitly said, like, I don't remember ever in a classroom, I was raised Catholic, but no one really said like, oh, masturbation is the worst thing possible. But I do remember mm -hmm. one time picking up a textbook in my, my older sister's uh, bedroom and it was like a sexual health or a health textbook. And it did say there was a little part of it that talked about masturbation. And it said, masturbation is perfectly healthy and normal and natural. And then in brackets, it was like, unless it's against your religion. And I just, I was just like, oh, I know that it's probably like anything within, like if anyone who was raised Catholic knows that uh, anything that feels really pleasurable and good, chances are there th that the messaging that you're going to get is like, stay away from it. So, really? um, so I, yeah, oh, for sure. Um, there's so much guilt and shame around desire, around anything that falls outside of the bounds of marriage, basically, mm -hmm. heterosexual marriage. Um, it's considered pretty much a no-no. So I knew that it was off limits. And so I grew up with a lot of really shame and guilt around my desires, around my body, and around my interactions with myself. And that, that shadow still kind of, I would say, has been over me for a long, long time. It's taken me a lot to try to uh, shake that off. Is that one of the reasons why you are so passionate about pleasure and why you created findyourpleasure.com? Yeah, in part, so there's two sort of reasons that I came up with Find Your Pleasure. One was because I was raised um, in such a really restrictive environment where I felt like I couldn't talk about anything. And when I was a teenager, um, my sister, who was a couple years older than me, she um, at one point came home and she was unintentionally pregnant. She announced this to the family. And it was at that moment that I really realized that these are the very real things that happen when you don't talk to people about sex you don't you disempower them and so at that moment i really crystallized a kind of interest for me i became that friend who wanted to like read up everything i could and i started writing an advice column when i went to my university in this little um magazine uh and and but then fast forward through my television career and my job on the social came i had you know was a few months after giving birth, I was sort of sleep deprived. I was breastfeeding in the middle of the night. I was very also anxious and nervous about this new show and really feeling like I had this, and I think every mother can relate to this, this ongoing list of to-dos and must-dos. And, and I felt like I was failing on all fronts as a, as a colleague, as a mother, as a wife. And wow. at one point, I just, I remember going on the show and, um, and I talk about this actually in my book, Find Your Pleasure, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, having this sort of crisis mode, it was probably a panic attack, where I thought I was going to sort of pass out live on, on the air. And it was, it was a wake up call for me at that moment, because when I was driving home, I remember thinking, I don't remember the last time I did anything just for me. And when I started reaching out to my girlfriends, the stories were all the same. It was like, I can't remember the last time I consistently did something for my pleasure, whether that was around my body or around my social activities or around my, and you were just talking about this before we went to air. Like we, we service our families, we service um, our partners. A lot of times we service our jobs before we service ourselves. 
And this yes. all kind of crystallized into um, this website that I created and eventually this book. I'm very okay. passionate about pleasure. I love this book. I have it right here. Find Thank you. <laughs> it's beautiful. It is a national bestseller, everybody. I, it is so beautiful to look at, but the content is incredible as well. And it's everything from, I guess you could say, sexual pleasure to laughing to eating, smelling flowers. I mean, it's everything that you could find about finding your pleasure. It's the art of living a more joyful life, which I love because I can I can relate to you on that. I, I certainly, having worked in live TV and, and went through my own issues of panic and anxiety, and I, I've talked about it now openly um, on this show for sure, but having my first panic attack was on live television. And, um, you know, the, <laughs> All, all of the experts would say to me, you know, you got, you need to shift, you need to start making a change, you need to start. But I think that when I started to feel better, were those little pieces that I gave or those little nuggets that I gave to myself, where sometimes it was just time, where I just needed time for myself, that was like ultimate pleasure because I was alone. Sometimes it was just space and air and breathing and all of those good things. But I have to say that there is truth in release, in sexual release. There is a lot of truth around that. Yeah. And I know people don't wanna talk about it and say it. And I certainly wasn't giving myself self-pleasure at work and doing all that, trying to release myself there. <laughs> no, I was not, I was to get that clear. But there were times where I knew that that was something I needed to do before and I needed, to, or I needed to do after because I knew that would make me feel so much better. And it did like remarkably. I love that you're saying this. Um, and I it's think it's truth. a big deal. It's a big deal because still women, I think are very sheepish. We have no problem talking about, you know, um, sex fairly openly these oh. days, but I do think self-pleasure still holds with it a lot of shame for lots of people. And there's this kind of, um, idea that if you are, if you're, you know, especially if you're in a partnership, you shouldn't want to do that, or that there must be something wrong in your relationship if you're looking for that. And what? I think, oh my gosh, I remember very distinctly when I was working on one show, um, I remember talking to a guy who was, uh, I won't name names, who was uh, uh, an on-air host as well. And I was just about to go and do something because I, I, I hosted a show about sexuality for a long, long time. Um, and, uh, Anyway, he, he, he had the, on that particular night, I was going to be talking about vibrators and he kind of scoffed and he said, uh, I, I said, well, he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm talking about vibrators and how you can, you know, both use them for solo sex. And you can also bring them into the bedroom with your partner. And he was like, I would never want to know what my partner does with those things. And I certainly wouldn't want to see them in the bedroom with me. And I mean, this is a multi-layered problem. So he was both saying he doesn't want to even know that his partner has those things or does those things, but that also that he was threatened by their presence in his um, relationship. And I just thought, I, I, I was, I felt empathy almost because I thought these, these are those, you know, reminders of the kind of shame and maybe misinformation uh, about, sure. about toys and pleasure and joy. And instead of approaching sexuality as like playful and curious and, um, you know, pleasure filled, I don't know, I, there's a different lens that's being placed on it for lots of people, which maybe is more about, I mean, I don't even know where to start with that guy, um, but it must have been about his masculinity, his identity, I don't know. But uh, I mean, I think we need to shift that discussion. That's, that is definitely, he's multi-layered for sure. He's multi-layered <laughs> for sure. Um, I, I could say so many things about that person and potentially about his relationship, but I don't know who you're talking about. So I can't, I, no judgment, of course. And I don't judge people generally, but I don't want to judge people when it comes to their personal sex and their sex life. But I know for me, um, such a breakthrough, such a huge breakthrough for me in my, I would say later in my life now and in my relationship, my marriage now with the person who I love and adore. And I, and I talk about him openly all the time, but one of the things, and I'm not shy of saying this, and I've said this very openly, is how great our sex life has been all of these years. And because I think we're both so open with each other, um, I wanted him to know how much I loved my body and that my body, I'm not talking about loving my body in a pair of jeans, 
because mm -hmm. that's a whole other issue and COVID has ruined that for a lot of women. But loving my body, how it feels, how it looks when I'm having sex, it was very important for me to express that to him. I wanted him to understand it. He was so grateful. He'd never been in a relationship that a woman had explained that. And so he was so grateful for it and it made it even more passionate between us. And so mm -hmm. when people talk about solo love, self-love, masturbation, I always say like, get to know your body and enjoy your body and share that love with the person you love and see if it makes a difference. Cause it made a huge difference for me. Like the sex I, is so much better. I think it's so important what you're saying. I think it's also important cause there's gonna be people who are watching right now or listening yeah. to this and they're sitting here going, I don't feel sexy. I don't relate to what's being said. If sex is another thing on my to-do list, I cannot handle it anymore. Agreed. Particularly during the pandemic, there are lots of people who are like, oh my God, this is the unsexiest time of my life. I'm living with you know, no boundaries, no separation from kids. So I wanna honor, people have trauma as well related to their bodies that can be triggered. But I think what you're saying is, is important too because one of the things um, as an advice column, I often get people writing in and I'll, I would say 90% of the questions start with, is it normal to, and fill in the blank here, or am I normal if, and I think this idea has to be thrown out the window of like, what is quote unquote normal? I mean, as long as it's, it's um, safe and it's consensual um, and it's grounded in, you know, um, truth for yourself, then it is, then it is uh, important to, to take note of. And for some people, that's going to mean that they have an intimate partnership and they are happy having sex, you know, once a month, once every six months. For other people, it would be once a week would be um, more than enough. Some people are daily. Um, I can't even imagine that personally. That would not be something that would be on my radar. But but if it's, it, you know, if it's something that works for the couple mutually, um, that's wonderful. It's when we get into these conversations around desire discrepancies and that these ways in which we've sort of, I think, positioned intimacy as one thing that we can get into trouble. And this actually goes back to the self-love piece, because I think a lot of men, in fact, were raised with almost the opposite message that mm. women were raised. So many women were raised to kind of like, don't touch that, don't do that, don't think about that. Um, don't touch yourself down there to whatever, or, or you know, whatever, or, and, and often will explore themselves in heterosexual context with their partner exploring them before they've explored themselves. I hope that's changing, I think it is. But men, on the other hand, in heterosexual context, I think they're often encouraged to explore themselves just even by the nature of the fact that they have to hold those parts while they pee. So there's a lot more general curiosity that happens naturally and an encouragement. And I do think though that men suffer, some men, from a lack of um, a diverse range of intimacy options so that when they get into a partnership, they often seek out sort of like they feel attraction, they feel horniness, they wake up with a heart on, whatever it is, and they want to release that with their partner. Whereas the partners maybe in some cases, it's like, I'm not your release valve, like, but the communication isn't there. And I think if more men, I've heard from so many women who are just like, if my partner would just be able to take care of his needs a bit more, and we could find intimacy in more than just, you know, penis and vagina sex, totally. I would feel so much more connected. I would yeah. feel so much more satisfied. Mm -hmm. um, so. I just want to honor that whole range of truths that are out there and still hold the peace that I do think if we can encourage um, young people from a young age, from a young age uh, to explore themselves, um, you know, in age appropriate ways, I do think it's going to serve them well for the rest of their lives. I do agree with you. I think this has been the least sexiest time I can, <laughs> I, I mean, I would, I would say most most days, most nights, I would rather close my eyes and go to sleep. I am depleted. I'm exhausted. Um, or I'd rather just maybe have some time to myself, go in the shower. I don't know, just be alone and, and not have to deal with the whole like, oh my God, the fireworks and the whole thing. Like, I'm just not into <laughs> it. It's too long and I need my sleep. And like, I, I get it, right? For sure. I would say 99.9% .9 of the people, not just women men and women have agree with that during this last year and a half but for me as i get to love my body i don't want to say my insides that sounds a little too that sounds a little too dramatic but <laughs> love my body as it is 
And again, not how it looks. I would just want to be clear, not how it looks in a pair of jeans. I just love the way it feels and how it makes me feel, helps me um, feel more desire. So that's mm -hmm. what I, and I, and I, that's why when I saw that you were doing the series on Instagram, I went, oh my God, I have to talk to you. There's such a thing called masturbation month. What? Yes. Was, yes. So what is masturbation month? I mean, obviously masturbation month is what it sounds like, but what really is, what goes behind that? So uh, my understanding of the origin is uh, we started in San Francisco. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a really amazing sex positive store that I think still is there. I was one of the first ones back in the late 90s, early 2000s called Good Vibrations. And it was women um, and I think trans led and owned. And uh, they had an amazing, just really smart people who were working there. And I believe Joni Blank, who was the person who created it, she came up with this idea that May should be dedicated masturbation month. And for a long time, uh, I don't think a lot of people do, but it would just sort of pop up in sex education circles or sex nerd circles, as I like to say. But it's really in the past few years has taken off. So I think a lot more people are aware of it. And, you know, even some companies have decided to make people like come for a cause. Uh, I think there was a, um, a, a company, a sort of sex tech company that actually got a bunch of people online um, to use remote devices and app and actually um, have orgasms together uh, just last month. So there's wow. a real interesting thing to kind of get different conversations going, especially right now, because during the pandemic, it's been so hard to, to physically connect with people yeah. um, unless you are in a partnership with somebody. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think the idea behind it is really just to get people talking and to dispel some of the myths that exist out there because they really have a long reach and, and um, sometimes it can be based in religion or culture, but just the general, even um, I think pop culture has really shifted in the past few years. You know, there, there were many, many years where you would have um, a movie like American Pie. Uh, remember that movie uh, back in the nineties, right? Where it was all basically about a bunch of guys who are looking yeah. to get laid, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I remember that around the same time, there was a movie called coming soon that came out and it featured a bunch of girls. You probably haven't heard of it. No, these girls were also it was a very similar storyline. They wanted to get laid. They wanted to lose their virginity. And I believe that there was a masturbation scene in it. And it was, it was, uh, it was slapped with sort of the NC 17, which was kind of a death sentence rating for movies at that time. You wouldn't be able to get wide release. And so it shows you at least for a long time, there was definitely a difference in the ways in which, you know, young men were able to talk about sex and desire and, you know, perhaps even self-pleasure in a way that, that young women weren't. And I think that's changed a lot. We've seen, uh, you know, everything from Samantha on Sex in the City talking about her rabbit and, you know, in Fleabag, I'm thinking about that. I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but um, yeah. the main character, she's, you know, watching, I think, a, a speech by Barack Obama and she's using her vibrator and masturbating. So we've seen a wide range. Definitely masturbation for women has come out of the closet. Gwyneth Paltrow and her whole goop thing. You oh know, my, uh, her, her vagina candle? Is it vagina scented candle? Yes, but she also on her, I think she had a brief show and she showed uh, there was this woman um, who recently passed away, but she was considered to be the kind of godmother of masturbation. And her name, she was out of New York and her, her name was Betty Dodson. Oh yeah. Google her. Yes. And so she used to have these kind of masturbation circles mm -hmm. with women where she would get them to bust out their Hitachi wands and look at themselves. Because this is the other thing. A lot of women still don't even look at themselves. I know. And I remember having this discussion on the social uh, in season one or season two, where I was talking about using um, tampons without applicators. And my co-hosts were so disgusted. No. By the idea that you would have to touch yourself in this way. And again, I'm not saying this is obviously not about self-pleasure, but there's a, a definite correlation between the way in which we see our anatomy, the way in which we think about touching it, the way in which we even see menstrual cycles. All these things kind of intersect to me um, and tell us about the sort of temperature that we have around loving our bodies. We have a lot of work to do when it comes to that. I, I remember um, as a teen taking a mirror and looking and going, what really this is, this is it yeah <laughs> fascinated I thought that was just fascinating I'm like wow and I kind of it, it dawned on me I'm like now I get it now I get why all those guys out there want to see that that's like the goal at that age it was <laughs> they wanted to see a vagina I'm like I get it like it's it's a pretty neat looking thing right because the, I I believe I, I, from my memory health class um 
we didn't have great pictures at all. We didn't. I mean, I, 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 in one of the videos I put on my Instagram recently, it was about how I was in probably my late thirties, early forties by the time I actually saw what the clitoris really looks like. And I wish I'd brought it. I left it downstairs, but, um, the clitoris, what you see is really just the tip of the iceberg, literally. It has legs that extend quite a long way inside of the body, and um, which is stupendous because like, I think, again, this, this, <laughs> like there's something really, like if you knew you're walking around with this sort of powerhouse in your, in, in your pants, like maybe we would kind of approach ourselves differently because the clitoris and the penis are, are much more analogous. Um, than the vagina. The vagina is like, it, it's, it's our birthing hole. It's the place where fluids come out of. It is not a pleasure center for most people. Although the G-spot for some is, a you know, still under some debate, but some people do like that stimulated. But for the most part, clitoris is queen. And so uh, it's always bugged me when we talk about the way we talk about sex ed and it's like, oh, you know, penis and vagina. I've had to really, with my son, I don't know, again, like, you don't want to make your kid be the weirdo kid in the class who's always getting everything correct and knows everything. But I've been sort of, I'm just always saying like, if he says to me, mommy, tell me about your penis. I'm like, I don't have a penis. <laughs> right. I said, I have a vulva and I have a clitoris. And he's still, he's like, you're, but at least I've got him away from you have a vagina and I have a penis. Because to me, there's, there's, you're baking in something mm -hmm. that's, that's quite profound there, which is the idea that, that, um, men can talk about their penises which are the pleasure centers which are their you know their reproductive organ as well and women are reduced to their reproductive organ it's problematic you know i have it is very problematic it needs to change i don't know at what point that's going to change in sex ed but i i i also have boys and i said to my eldest years ago and it started in grade five for him where he started to ask me specific questions and i said if you ask, I'm going to tell you, so I don't want you to be embarrassed. So you have to know that I'm going to tell you the truth when I, when you start asking me these questions. So he started and there was one time I remember him taking his hands. I was like, stop. Like he was just so freaked out by the idea of that. There was much more to a vagina than, and I thought, okay, maybe he's too young. Maybe I'm getting too graphic with him, but it, it does resonate a little bit. Even when they're young, it starts to resonate, and uh, I am a proud, great. I'm a proud mom of boys because I know that they <laughs> appreciate a woman's body. They're still young; they're teens, but I know that they're out there doing hopefully the right thing. Hopefully, parents who leave the door open for conversations do their kids such a service too. Just because I think kids do want to come to their parents with some amount of like questioning. It's better you yeah. than them going and googling it. <laughs> That's what I said. I just had this conversation with my youngest teen. Um, and I said, better that we have this conversation. We talk about it and I don't want you to feel embarrassed because I, I know your friends won't have the answers. Another teen boy will not have the answer that I'm going to give you. So I, I that's interesting because we segue to um, talking to kids. But first, when we're talking about your Instagram, um, the show that you were doing, so it's for KY, correct? Yes. Okay. So I did it in partnership with KY Canada um, because they are in the business of pleasure as well. So okay. I just adore their sort of, they've been so wonderful to work with because they really, really have, you know, we came up with ideas and, um, and it's just been like really great because they, I mean, they've been in the game for so long as well. Mm -hmm. They're still the number one physician recommended brand. I have so many different types of KY lube. I feel like they're within reach. Like <laughs> I got, anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, we have the same one. Okay, so this one's amazing, right? It is amazing. And I wanted, this is why I brought this into my studio here to show you because no, everybody, I'm not pleasuring myself <laughs> in my studio. I just forget that. Um, no, because you know, people are going to listen to this and go, what is she doing in there? So you started talking, I saw this on your show, uh, not on, sorry, not on the social. I saw you talking on your personal, on your social channel. And I was, I said, you know, I, I don't think I've ever used that one before. Well, I'm going to get it because Cynthia said it's good. So I went to get it and okay. Hey, describe. It's very, it's warming, right? It's like this kind of just immediate it, sort of, yeah. Okay. So it is an immediate, it's, it's, it's immediate. Uh, orgasm is not immediate. I mean, it could be for some people, but it wasn't for me, but it's the pleasure is divine. It's absolutely divine. And it's the warming. It's very, um, 
the only way I could describe it was, I guess if, if I was a man and I was inside a woman, what that warm, oh, moist feeling, right, would feel, that's what it, I got from this. I'm like, is this what it feels like for a guy? Because this is freaking good. This is really good. And this so, makes me so happy. That? <laughs> it makes me so happy to hear oh, you I'm say so this. happy yeah. to hear that. Mm -hmm. So I asked, I asked Kevin, I said, can I, can I try this? And he's like, yeah, sure. No problem. I'll, no, <laughs> of course. He said, so he loved it too. Good. Good. Loved it. We've tried several different ones. Um, and that was part of when I was talking to you about being open with him about my self-love journey is that I have tried different lubes because I find that they work so well and so efficiently. And I didn't want him to feel, um, not, not embarrassed. That would never be the word, but like not adequate. If I had to, if we had to use toys or lube, he wasn't, didn't, he said, I don't feel inadequate at all. I think that's fabulous. If you want to add some stuff in, that's great for me. So this is one of the things, um, but this one I would say was really good. I think what you said is just so important too, because there is, and this is stuff I covered in those videos, but there is this, again, misinformation about, about wetness, you know, and I, as much as I loved, you know, the big hit, the WAP hits, you know, everyone was talking about wet ass pussy, you know, that song that came out with yes. Megan Thee Stallion. Um, <laughs> and I was like, great, I'm glad they're embracing this because some, for some people, they feel embarrassed by their wetness. But then conversely, some people feel like their body changes as they get older and, or you might be breastfeeding. There's all kinds of things yeah. that can implicate the amount of wetness oh that a, yes. uh, a vulva owner produces naturally. And so the idea of incorporating it in should never be shame filled. It's not like you're dysfunctional. It's not like you're, you know, broken in any way. And I hope that people know that. But again, it was one of those things where I remember the first time someone talking about lube and I was like, Pfft. Like, I was like, oh, I don't need that. Like this sort of, I was, you know, oh, yeah. probably in my twenties and I, I, you know, I, I, it wasn't until later on that I realized, oh, you could just use it for, you can use it because you need it, but you could also use it just because it's fun and it's playful. Yeah. It's going back to that idea that, that toys fall into it and, you know, erotica and, you know, ethical porn, anything. And you don't have to do all of these things, but if you find a few things that work for you, I mean, why, why not? This is your you get one life, you get one body, um, you know, it clearly was designed to bring you pleasure. So why not figure out what the little, you know, secret system is within you and unlock those doors and spend some time doing that instead of I, make, maybe the bed, the, the bed's going to be a mess. Maybe your laundry's not going to get done. That's okay. <laughs> I love that. You just said that you get one life and you have one body just enjoy it mm -hmm. whatever that means for you right just yeah. enjoy it can, can we get back to um you have a powerhouse in your pants I read yeah. when you wrote that I freaked I was like yes 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 we do yes <laughs> I've got a powerhouse yeah. can we talk about it but just yeah. the idea of having a powerhouse because I felt like I read that and I felt like walking around all day going I got a powerhouse in my I know I know so having good. like that's big so clit good. energy, right? That's what I was calling it, big clit energy. Yes. Um, yeah, because big dick energy was a thing, right? We have this yes. idea that men walk around with these like things and hang and, and you know, there's a kind of like energy that sort of is swaggery and whatever. And women, I think conversely often are taught that there's, they're more internalized, that they're dainty. Um, the clitoris has like 9,000 nerve endings and it serves, there's no other part of the human anatomy on both the male form or the female form or any in between. But the, clit the clitoris was designed for no other purpose but pleasure. I mean, just think about that. It's mm. quite phenomenal. And I think if that had been <laughs> pressed upon, so to speak, uh, in my <laughs> sex ed classes, I think I would have felt sort of a, a kind of empowerment, kind of like, and this goes back to the self-love too. If, if, you, if you are saying in your sex ed classes, or if you say this to somebody who's, you know, uh, in your life, who's, who's developing into their sexuality, that you can figure out, you know, how to ring your own bell, that you can figure out how to be your own best lover if you want. This is a wonderful thing. This is something that you can enjoy for the rest of your life. This is your body. Figure out what works for you. That is an empowering move. And you're less likely to find then young women in particular going and seeking out love and, and attraction and, um, you know, uh, dependent on somebody else for their own pleasure. 
I think it would delay a lot of first time sex, a lot of uncomfortable sex things if there was more focus on on that. And that doesn't mean there are still all these myths out there that like, oh, you'll get addicted to your vibrator. I mean, I really think we have to question those a, a lot. It doesn't mean you can't become habituated to something. And obviously, um, you know, no one can replicate the exact uh, <laughs> vibration of a vibrator. But no one will ever replace a human being either, yeah, right? So yeah, I don't. I have to say, I don't mean to cut you off. I have to just no. say, for me, like I, I'm sharing. I mean, I'm throwing it all out there right now. But I, I don't like vibrators. I'm not a big fan either. I don't like them. Um, I just find that it's. I don't want to say it's. It's not fake pleasure. It's like, um, it, well, it's orgasm too fast for sure. And to me, that's not. That's not fun. I'm like, my body doesn't enjoy that. I'm like, what was that? Like, I, 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 it's like a sneeze. <laughs> you might be on the more of the sensitive side. Like I feel the uh, same yes. way that yeah, you, it, for other mm -hmm. people, they might feel like they need that really intensive thing to get there. It helps them because it might take them super long, but I, yes. I agree. Yes. Yeah. And I have, uh, I have close friends who would like, who very much like using both. Like they enjoy um, having their partner with them using a vibrator because that helps, but that whatever, right. It just, for me, I, I'm not a big fan of it. I, I really like this. this is really <laughs> the good news is though that I, like, and I haven't even explored, I feel like enough because pandemic, but there are all kinds of like, you know, um, things that suck now. Like there's, you know, womanizer is one. It's a terrible name for a toy. There's all kinds that they were the kind of first people in this game, but That's it's, it's a, like a suction cup. Um, oh. basically you put on your clitoris and it feels sort of like someone's sucking on your clitoris. So like, like that's a whole new, uh, wow. like there's a lot that's happened in the sex tech world. There's not just vibrators anymore. There's, wow. uh, there's things that flick also like just sort of like almost like a ton or move sort of like underneath a kind of silicone. Um, you can program sort of like this kind of almost nub that moves around your entire vulva. So it's worth exploring, even if you're if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I'm not into vibrators either. There's other stuff out there that you might yeah. find is interesting. That's interesting. I, I didn't know. I always just think of a vibrator as sort of that classic vibrator, but that's interesting. And what do you, would that be at a store or would that be on yeah, you, Amazon? Um, I, I would definitely not encourage Amazon. The okay. Two local places for anybody listening. And I think they deliver online anyway. Goodforher.com and comeasyouare.com. Um, those are two wonderful places. I'm just going to make sure they both are dot coms. Yes. Uh, as really, really you... good. They're really helpful. Very and very helpful. discreet. Come as you are dot com. That's right. And good. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you more about sex toys and lube, but um, while we're talking about lube, so this is the warming one from KY. Uh, is there another one that you would suggest? Yes. Uh, I mean, if you're into sort of more natural, listen, I, I just like, this is their, their uh, this is a, um, just another, like it's their naturals one. Mm. This is not, um, if you're interested though now in like, I feel like you're interested in a different texture. I think that they're, they're out there in the world. There are cooling ones as well. I'm like, oh, I'm, I, I can't like, remember if K1 like, makes one, but I like cooling too. I do. I think it's an interesting, like it's, um, if you blow on it a little bit, like there's a, there's a cooling sensation. Again, I don't know if KY makes one of those, but um, it's, if you like sensation change, that's one of them, but any one of KY's products is just, it's going to be slipperier. It's going to be, um, you know, a really great uh, feeling and you can just adjust the amounts that you want at any given point in time. Yeah. That's yeah. slippery. It's the slipperiness. Yes. <laughs> I hope that this conversation, I mean, I hope people that are listening, um, they don't, necessarily need to run out and talk about masturbation and self-love and um with others it, it's more about like for me when I when I read and saw and heard what you were doing it was just validating and I always say like if if I can talk about it on this show to validate how people feel to give them information to feel empowered then then we've done something we've done something good because it's yeah. you know I don't know why young women feel, I mean, we've talked about the reasons why young women feel that they can't talk about their bodies in, in a sexual way and that we have a pleasure center right between our legs that is just so powerful. Um, but I feel as I've, as I've gotten older, it's just like, it's on the table, right? It's my body and it's mm -hmm. there for a reason. And I feel so lucky that I have one. 
Like, and it's yeah. Just, yeah. What a, what an amazing thing. And to also, I love that you said to trying not to judge ourselves because mm-hmm. it gets, it's so easy for us. It's also so easy for us to get caught in these loops of, uh, of things we feel like we have to do for the family. Um, and, and I noticed this in myself, like, Desire is complicated. We, we think of ourselves as having, um, you know, a lifetime filled of what we experience oftentimes in new relationships, which is that we want to be with our partner and we're horny for them. And, you know, eventually that changes. And so what, what we have to do in many cases is sort of like cultivate our own. And if we don't set aside the time for that, it's very easy in a partnership or even in, a, in, in your own life to let your um, sexuality recede, 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 recede. And again, for some people, that's fine. That they don't mind that. But if if part of you is like, oh, I used to love this thing. I used to love the feeling of having an orgasm. Or I used to love even just the exploration. But I've now spend my evenings, you know, uh, making my to do list for the next day, or or stressing about the kids' schedules, or um, you know, going through piles of laundry, or you know, always having to watch the next latest show. What if, I guess I just want people to contemplate, what if you made once, first a date with yourself once a month? And during that date, you don't have to expect anything. Maybe you just start with a bath. Maybe maybe it is that you look at a piece of erotica. Um, maybe it is you explore a, a new toy, just something. And it might not lead to anything, but you might find that once you start stoking your own fires, that you want to stoke your fires again. Um, and then the longer, conversely, you leave it alone, the less you do. So. We do have to kind of, if you're interested, try to cultivate that kind of energy within ourselves. I love that. Can I share something with you? Yes, please. Okay, so, and this this will lend to find your pleasure. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think it must be a couple of years ago now, uh, I was on your website and um, there was a whole list of, should we say, is it called soft porn? It, it's, um, they were books that you had recommended there was a whole yeah. list of books. Yes. And I had picked up a couple of them. And oh, I thought, wow, if this is all it takes, like just to read a little bit. Um, and again, I always, I feel healthy, but I just always, I'm always wanting, like, I, I want it to be better. I want to feel better. There's lulls, there's times, there's particularly, like I said, this last year for so many people, just even reading something that could seem as a so much as a fantasy can help you get to that level you did that for me when I I'm went so onto your glad. website I was so great that's why I would send you messages and say you just you help so many people you probably don't even realize I know you get thousands of messages from people but I really wanted you to know how much it really really helped me and I want I, I want that means the world Oh, I'm so happy because it's the truth. I want people to know about Find Your Pleasure because it's so, it really is so great. Uh, it's a website and it's dedicated to pleasure, sensuality, and pure unadulterated joy. So yeah. we could just tell um, me just a little bit about Find Your Pleasure. Yeah, so it's the website that was kind of born out of that crisis I was talking about. And, uh, and uh, you know, there are all different categories. I write, a, I, I have a team of writers, but I also contribute. And um, initially it was just me, but then it got sort of bigger. And so I invited on this really amazing group of, of people to, to contribute. So the topics range on anything from, you know, talking about erotica or um, types of porn that's out there or self-love to, um, I think a recent post was about just tiny pleasures, just like finding like, in, you know, nothing sexual at all. It was just about, we're in the pandemic, how can we find new types of joy? About, um, there's a writer who recently wrote about their favorite things they've learned from reading self-help books. Um, I've written about my pets. I've, or I've written about my bird obsession recently. I've, I've turned into this yeah. like old lady who loves <laughs> watching birds. But I, you know, about, I've written about nature. I've written about, um, you know, uh, my partnership with Jason and uh, being a parent and the kind of amazing things that we learn about pleasure from watching our kids. You know, everyone who knows kids or has kids, especially at a certain age, they maneuver through the world with such fresh eyes and they're always exploring through their senses. And we lose sight of that as we get older. So part of what I've been exploring, you know, again, through mindfulness and through writing and is, and, you know, explorations of pleasure is just getting back inside my body, um, my eyes, my, my nose, my ears, all of it. I, I want to explore the world essentially at all times. I Not always that. easy. 
<laughs> and people can find your book it's online correct you can get it's online there are links through my website as well but you can okay. get it on um indigo amazon uh i think costco still sells it so uh yeah i mean and reach out to me i would love to hear from anyone who listened to this podcast uh drop me a line through my website there's an email attached to that as well oh you you, you will get people will <laughs> want to talk to you about this this is anytime i ever talk about anything to do with body sex sexual health it is a, it's a hot topic. People really love to talk about it. I love to talk about it too, because I know how much as somebody who would just listen in and would watch, it helped so much. So I felt that it was part of a responsibility if I'm going to be talking about everything that I needed to talk about it as well. So it's, um, it's been part of my journey, which I've loved so much, so much. So I really appreciate you coming on the DL and being so open. Thank you so much. In parting, I just, if there's one thing that you could give some wisdom to people who are um, maybe in, I don't want to know if I want to use the word funk, but in that pandemic, that state of mind still, and they want so much to come out of it and they want to reconnect with themselves, with their partner, what, what would you say would be maybe the first couple steps to do that? I think the first thing I would just say is give yourself permission and know that you're worthy of pleasure, however you define it. You're more than, uh, you know, you're more than just a parent. You're more than just your, um, you know, employee status. You're more than just a body as well. Um, you are all these types of things. So I think spend some time exploring your your inner life and and then start moving into the exterior. But give yourself like know that you are worthy of pleasure. And uh, but it doesn't pleasure doesn't always come to us. I think we have to start to uh, see it and see where we can find it in the world and then make space for that. That's wonderful. Cynthia, thank you so much. Such a joy. Such a treat. I'm filled with so much joy right now. Good news. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. It was really, thank you for being so candid and so honest. I really, I really appreciate you. And, and thank you for introducing me to your audience. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. Stay well and enjoy the you summer. Too. You too. Thanks so much. <laughs>